the Seattle's Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, Dr. Gary Gilliland is tapping an army of data scientists and cloud engineers, not to mention a few high-profile execs like mm, Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella and Amazon Web Services Mike Clayville to wipe out cancer. To learn more about how scientists might do this, please welcome to the GeekWire Summit stage, Dr. Gary Galiland of Fred Hutch. Ah, these are the comfy chairs. Yeah, it's a risk of my falling asleep. <laughs> well, we'll make sure we don't do that for the next half hour. Uh, Gary, um, you've been working on cancer research for 20 years as a researcher at, at Harvard, and I, I know that you worked at Penn, uh, and then you also worked for a little pharmaceutical company called Merck to try to bring some uh, important drugs to market for cancer. And I, I was looking at your bio, and, and you said, uh, this is the perfect time and the perfect place to develop curative approaches for cancer. Everything I've done in my career has pointed here to Fred Hutch. So there may be some folks out in the audience who need a little bit of a <laughs> tutorial about what the Fred Hutch is up to, why it's so important in the cancer search. So I thought I'd give you a few minutes to talk about that. That's great. Thanks, Alan and Claire. And uh, I'm delighted to be here. Thank all of you for attending this session. Sometimes I think that the Fred Hutch is one of the best kept secrets in Seattle, maybe apart from where the new Amazon HQ2 is going to be. But uh, for those of you who don't know the Fred Hutch, uh, we were founded in 1975, uh, same year as Microsoft was founded. We're down on the South Lake Union area on 14 acres that we couldn't possibly afford today. Uh, we moved there as sort of a founding um, anchor tenant, if you will, before everybody else moved in at the time when it was an, sort of an industrial wasteland. We now have about 3,000 employees. We have three Nobel Prize winners in physiology or medicine and a, a large number of world-renowned scientists. The Fred Hutch is the place where bone marrow transplantation was invented. Don Thomas received the Nobel Prize for that. So we've been curing cancer, curing blood cancers, for more than 40 years. And from that experience, we've learned how to harness the power of our own immune system to fight cancer. And that's where we think we have such amazing potential around curative approaches to cancer. Great. And it was two years ago that uh, you were up on a different stage and uh, said that in a decade we would have <coughs> cures or therapies for most, if not all, human cancers. Uh, okay, we're two years into that decade, and uh, I wanted to give you a chance to revise that prediction or back away from it, because I think that was a little bit risky to, to give a time frame for curing cancer. Uh, I did say that, and... Um, and we reported on it, which, which and, was a big John, clap. John Cook had it posted before I even finished the sentence, so <laughs> it got out there, which I, we're actually, I'm actually very grateful for. And Alan, no, I'm not, I'm not coming back from that one bit. I stand by that, and it's true that I've gotten some, uh, some push around this from various sectors, but we truly have the potential to cure cancer. We have it in our hands. We are curing cancer. What we need to do is to extrapolate what we're doing to all patients with all forms of cancer. And we have the capacity to do that. We've made extraordinary progress in the last two years towards that goal. So I, I stand by it. When people push on it, what I say is, let's stop talking about this and stop debating it and stop trying to make excuses for why we can't do it. Let's get out there and do it. And no excuses, no patient left behind. And we have extraordinary potential to be able to approach that, Alan. We have um, amazing new technologies that are coming into play. And there's a real sense of urgency. If you don't put a stake in the ground and say, we've got eight years now before 2025, if you don't put that stake in the ground, we're not going to get that done. So I stand by that. And it's a, it, the urgency, I think, was emphasized in part by Kevin Johnson this morning sharing that he had been diagnosed with melanoma. This affects all of us. How many in this room have been affected by cancer? Raise your hand. 
So the only people I can see that aren't raising their hands have their hands on their devices. <laughs> it, 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 it's true that it will affect all of us. If you look to your right and look to your left, one in three of you will develop cancer in your lifetime. It's actually more like one in two for men. So there's a real urgency around this, but we do have opportunities to move forward with um, new and innovative therapies. There are 60% more drugs that have been approved in the oncology pipeline over the last 10 years, and there's 630 different drugs that are being tested uh, in oncology. So uh, we're making progress with that. Uh, at the Hutch, we're making new drugs, such as the chimeric antigen receptor T cells or CAR T cells, where we take a patient's own immune system, T cells, we genetically reprogram this he can destroy, and we're mm -hmm. seeing response rates in patients that had terminal disease, terminal cancers like acute lymphoblastic leukemia of greater than 90%, complete remission that translates into cures. So we're actually quite optimistic about the opportunities that we have moving forward, and I do stand by that. I, I think that it still sounds like a tough, tough road ahead to talk about curing any sort of disease within and within eight years, uh, what gives you, it's going to take breakthroughs, and uh, what gives you the confidence to do that? Uh, is, are there some things that, uh, that are trends in the industry that suggest that a breakthrough like that is really possible? Well, we, yes, Alan, there are. We actually have had breakthroughs. That's what informs the perspective on how it is that we're going to cure cancer, is that we've had extraordinary breakthroughs in a number of areas in the arena of cancer, but in particular around the field of immunotherapy. I mentioned the CAR T cells as one example. I mean, it's stunning to be able to genetically reprogram a T cell to see can destroy cancer in an individual patient. We've also developed immunomodulatory therapies. This is what I worked on when I was at Merck, a disease, a drug called Keytruda. And this drug does nothing more than take the breaks off of the, of the immune system and allow it to do what it was trained to do, which is to seek out and kill cancers. This is the drug that was used to treat President Carter, uh, who, as you may recall, at the age of 89, was diagnosed with a, a, basically a death sentence, metastatic melanoma to his brain, metastatic melanoma to his liver. Apropos of uh, Kevin's comments this morning, uh, you wouldn't survive that. He wouldn't have survived that in the past. But with no chemo, no radiation, he was treated with this drug that does nothing more than take the breaks out of his T cells, and he's in continuous complete remission, or which translates into cures. Those mechanisms alone have tremendous potential as single agents, but we're now beginning to combine them with some of our other conventional therapies. So I truly believe that the technology is there. And, and the rate at which this is changing and moving is exemplified on the, the graph that you're looking at, which is the cost of sequencing a human genome. The very first genome that was sequenced, remember these are three billion base pairs of DNA that you have to line up in the right sequence, uh, was $100 million. And that's fallen rapidly, um, actually basically uh, dissolving Moore's Law uh, tenets so that the cost of sequencing a genome now is about $1,000. So we're at the asymptote where it's more expensive to store the data in the cloud than it is to do the sequencing. And that's the pace at which this is moving, and that should give us a lot of confidence that the technology is going to drive this inflection point that we're at today towards curative approaches in a very short time frame. And if we don't get there, then shame on us. So you mentioned genetic sequencing. Um, Dr. Lee Hood, who is the founder of the Institute for Systems Biology, one of the drivers, the local driver of the early genetic sequencing. And I know you've also spoken about other technologies that are really being developed here now, things like big data, the cloud. How are those, what we would think of as more traditional techie technologies, coming into play to cure cancer and, and other diseases? Yeah, that, thanks for that question, Claire. This is an incredibly exciting time. Uh, because of where we are. I mean, the reason I'm in Seattle today personally is not only because of the Fred Hutch, but be because we're sitting in an environment where there's, like no other in the world, where we have a confluence of outstanding expertise in bioscience, but also in computer science, in data science. I mean, Seattle is cloud city. We've got Amazon and Microsoft and many other tech companies represented here right here in town, many of them near South Lake Union within walking distance. And to Alan's point, we haven't been shy about asking for help. Sachi is on our board, Mike Clavel's on our board from AWS Global Cloud. And what a cool thing that even though these two companies uh, compete at some level, 
I guess they actually have Alexa and Cortana dating, so I'm not sure what that's all about, but <laughs> they, they can cooperate. But the, the cool thing is to have these two executives coming together at our board and beyond and helping us think about how we can drive the, the management of large data sets, which can be as much as terabytes per person, to individualize um, treatments and develop precision approaches to oncology. So it's f a fantastic opportunity. We have, uh, through the cloud, the opportunity also to, to collaborate with scientists worldwide who can gain access to the cloud. And boy, what an incredible um, capability locally around data science with AI and machine learning algorithms that we're applying in ways that we may come to, as well as to um, natural language processing, which is a huge boon for us in trying to decipher uh, the complexities of electronic medical records that are required for us to be able to implement the best possible care. So Seattle, Seattle's a place where this is gonna happen. And the thing that's exciting for me is that, you know, we're a state now that's known for airplanes, um, Kevin here this morning, we're known for coffee, we're known for e-commerce, we're known for software. Let's be the state that's known working together as the epicenter for developing curative approaches to cancer by integrating these capabilities uh, in our city and in our state. Let's talk a bit more about the, the therapy you mentioned earlier, CAR-T therapy. Um, I believe we have an, an image here of CAR-T cells attacking a cancer cell. Can you give us a high-level view of what's going on here? And yeah, this is... And, and remember, we're talking with techies here, so you might have to keep things a little simple. <laughs> no, I, I, I think it usually goes the other way, Alan. That's what I found when I talk with techies. <laughs> I have to ask them to take it down a notch for me. But, um, this is actually a colorized slide, but other than that, this is a, a real electron uh, micrograph. And in green, you see T cells that were taken out of a patient that had acute lymphoblastic leukemia. We reprogrammed these genetically with these chimeric antigen receptors. And they're called chimeras because on the external uh, outward part of the cell, we put in a, um, a laser guidance system, molecular laser guidance system that can seek out and destroy cells that express a certain um, marker that denotes the tumor and distinguishes it from other normal tissues. Inside of the cell, we engineer in a module that is ex essentially an explosive device that allows the cell to attach to the tumor cell, detonate the explosive, and then the cool thing is these are living, breathing organisms. They don't ever go away. They'll move on to the next thing, next tumor cell, so that when we give these cells to patients, we give a dose, um, a volume that's about the size of a grain of rice. And that's it. No rounds of chemotherapy, no cycling of chemotherapy, one dose, a living organism, it's the patient's own cells that are precisely engineered to, to target their tumor. And what you see here is three cells, they're small cells, um, it's sort of a David and Goliath fight, but they destroy these tumor cells and explode them. In fact, our biggest challenge in managing the clinical care is not inducing uh, cures, it's managing the explosive, the consequences of explosion of large uh, tumor volumes within the patient. But it's... Uh, the problem you want to have. <laughs> it's, yeah, it is. Uh, now, this is the point probably where uh, we talk about all these great things that can be done, and then if you were selling a car, you would say, and it's only, you know, $70,000. People have talked a lot about the cost of health care. Is this going to be something that is going to be affordable only for the few? Uh, are there people who are just going to have to go in and get their genome done and, uh, and it's something for the rich, or do you see this as possibly <coughs> transforming the way that, that health care is done? That, that's another great question, Alan, and a real challenge that we need to face in our society because the rising cost of oncology drugs currently is not sustainable. So we need to think about how to manage those costs. And I'll make a couple of points that are relevant. One is that if you have um, an expensive therapy, let's say Herceptin, which is an antibody that's used to treat women with breast cancer that express HER2 nu, women will take that uh, for the entire duration of their life, typically on a three-week cycling basis. It's incredibly expensive, and it doesn't cure anybody. If you balance that against a single treatment, that has curative potential, or if you bring in value-based care, which our healthcare reimbursers are doing uh, more often, and say you're only getting reimbursed if you cure somebody. If it doesn't work, we're not paying you. So that changes the price point, and it should help um, drive the value proposition. 
Most important thing, though, and, and we learned this at Merck, and I was actually very happy about this, that it wasn't just Merck that worked on this mechanism. Uh, BMS, Roche Genentech, some fantastic companies work on this, and when these drugs all get approved by the FDA, it helps drive the price point down. We've seen that with hepatitis C. And for these CAR-T therapies, we're not the only game in town. I would argue that we're the best, um, and we'll have some news coming out about that in a few days about uh, how we differentiate from other CAR-Ts on the market. But Novartis just had one approved a few weeks ago. Kite Pharmaceuticals, a small biotech, just had one approved. That's a good thing, because it will drive price down um, with the competition in the market. So it is a challenge, but I think it's one that can be managed against the backdrop of the value proposition for curing people that then go on to a normal, happy, healthy life and aren't continuing to need to take expensive medicines. You mentioned a few biotech, um, one of them a startup, Kite Pharmaceutical, um, and one of uh, Fred Hutch's prominent startup spin-offs is Juno Therapeutics, who is based here in Seattle. Um, Kite was just acquired, or announced a deal to be acquired a few weeks ago for $11.9 billion. So it's safe to say it's a lucrative market for startups. Um, for folks out there who are interested in doing a biotech startup or joining one, um, what would you say are the areas that are most interesting and innovative to go into right now? Well, thanks, Karen. The fun thing about these startups is, I mean, they're very exciting places to work. Uh, most important thing for the Hutch is that that's the, the best strategy, and I know this from having been on the pharma side, that's the best strategy for bringing drugs to patients and for commercializing, and to Alan's point, we've got to get this out to every patient or we're, or we're not succeeding. So it's a, it's a fantastic way to move quickly and nimbly uh, towards approval, and that's why these drugs have moved so quickly. The other fun thing is that because these drugs are so effective, you often don't have to do randomized trials to prove that it's better than conventional treatment, that they're so good that you can approve based on a single arm study, which is, had been almost unheard of in, in any disease area. So that moves the pace forward more rapidly, and that's why we're so pleased. We're very proud of Juno Therapeutics and what they've accomplished, Adaptive and other spin-outs. It provides a value proposition for us um, with equity stake in the companies to be able to reinvest in our 501c3 um, nonprofit research machine. But uh, we're very eager to engage partners, and it's not just around CAR-T therapies, that there are a lot of other innovative approaches we're taking, such as using nano devices to inject into patients to reprogram their T cells without having to take them out. We're using machine learning to understand how to predict outcomes from patients receiving conventional therapy. We're looking at wearable devices, chatbots, uh, mobile apps that help us and patients monitor their progress so that we can deliver the best possible care. Are, so are these technologies that you're looking to match up with entrepreneurs as, for example, Intellectual Ventures has this incubator. Are you having an in incubator that you're incubating? We, uh, we, have, uh, we have our head of business development here today, Nikki Robinson, uh, who's the best qualified to answer that. But we do have small amounts of funds that we invest internally, but we're not a venture firm. We don't intend to be. It actually isn't, doesn't support our mission the way that we think about it. But boy, do we need partners out there from places like uh, Ivy and from other venture that can help us bring these to market and commercialize them. And, and honestly, I, I've also learned this in my career, that's not what we're good at in academic environments. We're, we're good at a lot of stuff. We're good at innovation, but we really need partnerships to help drive forward some of these um, opportunities. So any of you who want to talk with me about this afterwards, or come see the Hutch, we're just right down the hill. I mean, it's a, this is kind of a small place. Many of you are local, so we're here. If you have an interest um, in anything that I've talked about today, come talk to us. We have a few minutes left and, and uh, thought we might be able to get some questions, and there may be some questions in the audience, uh, so I think we have a couple of runners. Uh, and we have a person here who is ready for a mic, and while the mic is being brought, let me uh, pass along a question that we received from SurveyMonkey, Gary. Do you think the medical community as a whole does a good job of providing data-supported answers for patients about the best available treatment for their particular situation? What could be done better, and how can technology help? That, that's a terrific question, and I would answer by saying we, we can do a better job. Uh, there's a couple of tools and mechanisms that patients can use if they're interested in getting onto a clinical trial, for example. Uh, there's one site called clinicaltrials.gov where every sponsor, every trial that's done anywhere in the United States has to be registered, but it's a very cumbersome tool. 
it's easy for me to get in and use it. It, it looks, it's almost impossible, I think, for um, a, a layperson to uh, navigate the very uh, challenging complexities of that site. There's a lot more that we can do um, in our healthcare systems to generate um, adequate data sets for us to be able to understand just things like where are the patients that have these diseases. We're the only comprehensive cancer center of 47 in the United States for the five-state whammy region that includes Washington, Wyoming, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho. Um, but to your point about how do we get this out there to those folks, how do yeah. we make sure that, that not only do they know that they can find us, which is how we've typically worked, how do we find them? And there are ways through um, data sets that are anonymized initially that we can find people that we think are actually good candidates for treatment, and that can enhance the rate of accrual and the pace at which we uh, develop drugs because we can enroll patients that are ideally suited, meaning they're likely to respond to the treatment that we have. Mm -hmm. and I'll just point out while we're waiting on this, this tube that's right in front of you, I don't know if you can see it, but at the very bottom, there's a teeny little white thing. That's a full dose of re-engineered T cells that a patient's going to get. That's what we give them. And the rest is history. And they're tailored for the patient. Tailored for the patient. That's mm -hmm. the patient's own T cells. Okay, we have a question. Okay. Shifting from treatment to detection, in 1977, the lifetime risk of a woman dying from breast cancer was 1 in 30. In 2015, it was 1 in 29, basically flat. So how do we address the two in five women who are diagnosed with advanced disease that has not been detected by mammography, ultrasound, or MRI so that they don't need your drugs? Yeah, that's a, a, a good question, and it's a, it's a tragic circumstance that so many women uh, present with advanced disease that hasn't been detected by conventional modalities. I mean, there are some cases where um, that compliance is a very important part of this. We need to make sure that people, women, get out there and get their screens and that they're safe and effective. But that's true not only for breast cancer, but it's true for uh, lung cancer, for pancreatic cancer, for colon cancer. So often by the time we know a person has these diseases, it's metastatic. And in the past, that would have been a death sentence ultimately. We do believe that these new curative approaches for things like melanoma, these drugs work in non-small cell lung cancer. They do, we're looking at breast cancer, that there's an opportunity even for people with advanced disease. But the short answer to your question is that there are methods, um, very technologically demanding methods for detecting circulating cancer cells or detecting their circulating nucleic acid. That's maybe where you were going with your question. And that's where you generate terabytes of data because you need to do extremely deep resequencing to find the one cancer cell that might be circulating and the molecular profile of that cell will give you a really good idea about what type of cancer it is that might be circulating in the peripheral blood. If you can pick that up at a time before it's spread, all those cancers that I just mentioned to you can be cured with surgical resection as long as you pick them up at stage one in most cases. So there's a tremendous opportunity there, but if, if you generate, um, there's a company that uh, we have an interest in called Grail that's use, using technology that was developed at the Hutch uh, that does deep resequencing of circulating nucleic acid. They estimate that they'll need to generate about a terabyte of data per person and uh, you're the techies and I'm not, but they explained to me that that um, over a population the size of the United States would take more cloud capacity than all technology companies combined, including Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft. So we'll have to scale if we want to try to approach that. The other challenge with that approach is that you worry about false positives. You don't want to scare people if they don't have a, a high risk of developing cancer. And it's likely that we have circulating tumor cells. We're all generating mutated cells in our blood, bone marrow, colonic epithelium as we're sitting here. Not all of those turn into cancer. So we also need to make sure that we're not spending too much time and effort chasing um, a, a rabbit down a hole, but that when we find something, it really does mean that there's likely to be a cancer somewhere in that person's body. So it sounds like personalized health is like a grand frontier for cloud computing. It is, and it's going to be, the uh, Alan, it's going to be If we think data the driven. cloud is big now, it's going to be huge. I think and that's I th what you're saying. It is, and I think that, you know, bioscience may be a little bit late to this game. Um, as I alluded to earlier, we're not as bright as the people in this audience, but, you know, we're, we're learning, we're figuring out that we need you, we need um, 
data science, we need computer science to be able to realize the potential of the technologies that we have. We've got the technology, we know how to do this, we just need to execute and implement. We have a gentleman who wants to ask a question over yeah. here. First of all, thank you for all, the, for all the work you're doing, it's really great. And great earlier question on diagnostics, we see a lot of new tools, which is exciting. And wondering if or how Fred Hutch sees their role in prevention, it seems you know, we wait for people to get sick before we treat them, and now we have all these tools. What are we doing to potentially prevent, and does Fred have, Hutch have a role in that, in Thank that you. space? Thank you. It's a hugely important question, and um, we're deeply dedicated to prevention. It's a lot better to prevent cancer than it is to try to treat it. We're nationally known as being the best public health science group in the country, and I'll give you a couple of examples of what we've done. One is that the Hutch is the place where the dots were connected between human papillomavirus and cervical cancer. 100% of women who develop cervical cancer will have been infected with human papillomavirus. Based on that insight, uh, we initiated efforts that were subsequently followed up by Merck and Sanofi and others to develop an HPV vaccine. So the only thing we have to do to prevent 90% of cancer, cervical cancer in the world is to make sure that girls 11 to 13, and ideally boys in that same age group who are the carriers, are vaccinated. We can cure those, we can prevent those diseases from ever happening. Another um, effort at the Hutch uh, focused on women's health, 160,000 women that have been followed for um, more than uh, 10 years. And amongst other um, attributes of the study, it identified the fact that we were giving symptomatic postmenopausal women too high a dose of estrogen. That led to an increased risk of breast cancer. We decreased the dose and the, the uh, incidence of breast cancer that can be attributed to estrogens is uh, dropped dramatically. It was about a $200 million study that the federal government supported, so it's not cheap, but the savings in lives and productivity mm -hmm. and cost of medicines um, to the country has been about $35 billion. So it's not just about saving women's lives, though that's the most important thing about prevention. It's about how do we try to address the escalating cost of yes. health care, and if you don't have to treat cancer, it's not as expensive as when you do. That's a great question, and, and we're deeply dedicated to prevention. Well, this has been a great uh, presentation, and I, I'm sorry that we don't have time for more questions now, but I hope you'll be able to stick around and, and uh, be sure to hook up with Gary, and if you've got something you want to pitch, <laughs> the door is open. I'm open. I've got Nikki here, so we're, we're good to go. Okay. Yes, thank, thank you, you so Gary. much, right. Gary. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>